And here you thought the Supreme Court was all done and heading home for the summer. How wrong you are. For we have lines of American power and capital punishment and a whole lot more to still haggle over. The New York prisoners are no longer on the run, one in a body bag and the other preparing for a life of 24-7 lockdown. So how do we ensure killers like these never get a second chance at freedom again? Not one, but two countries going belly up and both ready to ripple across America. This while lawmakers twiddle their thumbs and are basically helpless to do anything to do about it. And in telling it like it is, three issues for America and only one deserves your complete and undivided attention. Changing the way America and the world understands the news. No agenda. I'm Ed Berliner. This is The Hardline for Monday, June 29th, 2015. The court decided today that uh, Oklahoma and other states can continue using a controversial sedative as one of the drugs in lethal injection executions. The question was whether the drug works well enough to put inmates into a deep coma-like sleep before uh, two other drugs that are, can be quite painful are injected. What's clear is that our work is far from over. The theatrics of Texas Attorney General Paxton, who has blatantly encouraged state officials to defy the highest court in the land, is evidence of that very fact. The Attorney General is irresponsibly empowering and encouraging obstruction and delay. Your mission is as simple as it is daunting, to save the world before it's too late. It's the overwhelming judgment of science that climate change is real and the result of human activity. And as Pope Francis has so eloquently pointed out, climate change is a moral imperative that transcends politics. By a five to four decision, the court has emphatically rejected arguments that Ohio, I mean, Oklahoma's uh, three-drug protocol violated the Constitution's Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, the court is very emphatic uh, that this is an issue that, that uh, Oklahoma was entitled to decide. There was no evidence uh, to support claims that it did cause this kind of pain and suffering. The Supremes have spoken yet again to the ground trembles beneath us. From setting new border lines that will decide local party leadership to another shot at cruel and unusual punishment for convicted and killers and plenty more. We'll talk about that, but first there is an issue of civil rights in America and same-sex marriage. First up, the Roy P. Crocker Professor of Law at the University of Southern California, also author of Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism, The Hidden Costs of Being Black in America. Welcome Professor Jody Armour to the hard line. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Ed. Professor, there's been so much discussion here in the last couple of days about same-sex marriage and the equation of it to the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. Do you believe that people are right when they make that sort of a comparison? Well, let me put it this way. I'm a product of a marriage between a black man and a white woman that was not legally recognized in much of the country in the 50s and 60s when they were trying to bring their love together and make a family. Uh, so the state has oppressed people, socially marginalized people, through its definition of, definition of marriage in the civil rights context. And uh, certainly LGBT community was arguing that they were being oppressed through the narrow definition of marriage until this uh, Supreme Court decision very, you know, a few days ago. What about those on one side of this issue that are saying this proves that it's time for the government to get out of marriage once and for all? Yeah, well, in a sense, the government is out of marriage in this way. It's not telling clergy that they have to marry people. It's not butting into religious beliefs. It's not compelling anyone to marry anyone else. All it's saying is marriage is a civil institution, and we're going to civilly recognize it. That's not going to trample on your First Amendment rights to practice your religion any way you want. Interesting note from the report for public justice. It's the Center for Public Justice that actually put this out saying same-sex marriage is not a civil right. They say the simple fact is that the civil right of equal treatment cannot constitute social reality by declaration. A lot of legalese going on in there. What do you think? 
Well, there is. Well, what they're saying, though, essentially is you can't legislate morality. You can't make people accept same-sex marriage. No, you can't. That's right. The court couldn't make people love integration. Back in Brown versus Board of Education, they couldn't make people start to reject segregation. But they can show by leading what values the Constitution stands for, for and the American flag stands for, and that's what they did. I got about 30 seconds left here. There are certain people who say that civil disobedience is called for now. As a matter of fact, Governor Mike Huckabee said exactly that. It's time for people to show that they are against same-sex marriage. What do you then think about civil disobedience here as a way to show protest? Well, you can do that. You know, that, that is the American way. That's free speech. You can go that route if you want, but you can also risk looking like a Neanderthal. You can risk looking morally obtuse and behind the times and outmoded. So they can try that if they like, but it might not work out. Would you then call Mike Huckabee and others who say things like that Neanderthals? I would say that they are behind the times. More and more people are accepting same-sex love and saying that love, too, deserves human dignity and to be recognized by the nation. It is just beginning, this whole battle, and we'll continue. Professor Jody Armour, a pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll look forward to the next time we get a chance to talk. Good talking to you, Ed. How much pain a convicted killer undergoes as he or she is being put to death is a flashpoint issue from the Supremes as we begin the week. Let's dig into this from the law enforcement side. Let's welcome a former Capitol litigator and chairman of the Criminal Justice Department at John Jay College in New York City, Evan Mandery. Evan, thanks so much for joining us, and let me get right out of the way. First of all, your reaction to the Supreme Court decision. Uh, I, I don't think it's very surprising. I, I, I don't think many people in the death penalty community held out any substantial hope that the Supreme Court was uh, going to overturn the lethal injection protocol here. Is the key words again, or should I say, are the key words once again here, cruel and unusual punishment, which seems to be three of the toughest things to actually prove when you're dealing with a drug like this? Um, I think the key premise is that if you accept that the death penalty is not cruel and unusual punishment, then you need to hypothesize that there is a, a, a constitutional way to execute people. So it's that first step. You either think that the death penalty is cruel and unusual, which obviously Justice Alito in the majority does not, and Justice Breyer in the dissent does. Then once you get past that threshold, you just kind of have to bite the bullet and say, well, we think the penalty is tolerable and states are going to need a method to carry it out. Now that we've seen the Supreme Court rule on this case, what's your opinion of where the death penalty opponents will go from here? I don't think this was a central prong of the uh, abolition strategy. And uh, if, the, if the Supreme Court were to strike down the death penalty as cruel and unusual punishment, um, it wouldn't have been on this grounds, uh, on these grounds. Uh, I think the, the attacks that you're going to see is, one, that the death penalty is so arbitrary and so racist that it hasn't satisfied the mandate of these two cases in the 1970s um, that laid the framework for evaluating the death penalty, and two, that the trend both in legislatures uh, and in actual use of the death penalty has been against capital punishment. Is it also going to be, as the justices even themselves stated, that this is a matter of if you're going to use the death penalty, it needs to be used quickly, efficiently, it needs to be used with, with some real time behind it, not just sticking it out for 5, 10, 15 years. It's that arbitrary nature you spoke to. Yeah, I mean, the time, uh, Justice Breyer's dissent is really a tour de force, and there's a whole section which talks about how the long delays associated with capital punishment really under, undermine the penological objectives of it, right? You don't achieve deterrence if it takes so long, uh, as long as 15 years to execute someone. And um, also, it's, it's a kind of an, it's in, it's an independent inhumaneness to the actual execution itself. As we look to where then they go, we've already talked about what that next central piece of strategy might be. What do you think this foretells then for the overall battle against the death right. penalty in this country? That, that's the interesting question. So I think there are only two bits of information. I think from a, a constitutional law standpoint, this was a non-event. Uh, the Supreme Court has never struck down a method of execution. Nobody thought that it was going to here. Um, there are two things that came out of this that are interesting. One is that Justice Kennedy associated with the majority. And if the Supreme Court is going to strike down the death penalty, Kennedy is the essential fifth vote. Um, so that's bad news, though. I would say it's very modest bad news if you're against the death penalty. Um, I think if Kennedy were going to strike it down, it wouldn't have been on these grounds. 
The second bit of information, which is tiny, seconds. which is the tiniest bit surprising, is that Justice Sotomayor didn't sign on with this tour de force dissent I mentioned. She did vote against lethal injection, but didn't sign on to this overall project against the death penalty. And the fight will go on. Evan Mandery, thanks so much for joining us. We continue right here on the Fastest 60 Minutes in News.